Yeah, hi folks. Now today I want to give you a brief overview of the Littlewood Treaty because it is really pertinent in respect to the separatist nonsense we're seeing in New Zealand today. And hat tip to rather be fishing for this one. Now this document was written by Henry Littlefoot, who was a solicitor in uh, the Bay of Islands and Auckland back in the 1840s. And the document went missing uh, for about 150 years before it was found again. Now it is very important because it really describes the true intent behind the Treaty of Waitangi. Anyway, today I'll start this off with Ian Wishart who describes what life was like back in the 1840s. Uh, what I've done is I've gone back to the official documents of all mm. the explorers and settlers who came to New Zealand since uh, basically Abel Tasman arrived here and wrote reports on it. Mm. And I've gone back and done the complete lead up to the Treaty of Waitangi so that we can see yep. in context what Māori society was like, um, what political, uh, political um, groupings existed within Māoridom, what their aspirations were, what they understood settlers to mean, what they understood the treaty to mean. Uh, so that we can get a clear photograph, a snapshot of 1840 and the years leading up to it, to say, what did Māori really think about the treaty? Forget about what you've heard now. Forget about what uh, well, the Māori what Party is, is saying and everyone else is saying about what the treaty means. What did Māori in 1840 believe really? they were signing? What did they think they were getting? Well, what they believed they were getting, they knew they were seceding their, their sovereignty. Uh, yes, and there was no partnership and no co-governance. They knew that? They knew it. They explicitly had arguments about it at Waitangi, mm. uh, and they had huge discussions about it. And, and the reason that they did it was, was for several reasons. One was that the missionaries had come to New Zealand, and they had brought the gospel uh, to Māridom. Māori society, up until the missionaries arrived, was a cannibalistic society. It was very utu-driven, and, and revenge, revenge raids yeah. were daily and mm. commonplace, and a tribe would go along, they would... Uh, take offence at something that another tribe had done or another family had done. They would go and they would raid it. They'd take away the women and children. They'd kill the men. They'd enslave the women and they'd eat the children. Eat the children. Um, and so there was this tension. And there was no single Māori nation. There were... Yeah, and nor a single Māori language as they pretend exists today just a collection of, of 40 or 50 mm. tribes mm. who had their own rules and fought amongst themselves. Yeah. Now add to that the, uh, uh, the system of food that they had. There was no real agriculture apart from kumara, and the kumara that they had were, were not the same as the ones you get in the shops today, which are big and fat in South America, and the kumara that they had back then <laughs> were about the size of your finger. Yeah. They were not great sustenance. Mm. So the other major things they had were, were seafood uh, mm. and uh, native pigeons and birds when they could catch them, and that was hard work. Uh, and uh, fern root, which was the basic bread of their society. But to uh, make fern root into, into edible... Uh, something you could eat. Something you could eat. Yeah, yeah. You had to bash it for half a day. Mm. It was horrendously labour-intensive. Mm. And so uh, a lot of energy went into just providing enough for the next meal mm. as opposed to growing the tribe and growing its resources and, and everything else. So they didn't have a lot of food. They didn't have warm clothing. So when James Cook turned up, uh, and traded blankets uh, and, and things like that. That's what the Māori wanted because mm. they said it keeps us warm. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's yeah. a cold winter, yeah. and these yeah. these 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 uh, Pākehā they have warm blankets mm. and warm clothes, and that was highly sought after. Then, of course, the the next big thing once they became warm uh, was iron because Māori had no technology beyond stone, mm. uh, and the iron axes and and what have you that and even nails that uh, the the, the uh, they were sought uh, after. They, they were tremendously mm. sought after because, you know, for chopping down a tree and providing wood for your fire, an iron axe was much more efficient and much quicker than your greenstone Mary. So, again, there was this. This vision of the advantage of the technology that was being brought in by the by the explorers. So by the time Waitangi came around, a lot of the Māori had been Christianised. They'd renounced their uh, cannibalism. They had renounced their previous spirituality. They had accepted the uh, religion of the settlers and the explorers and said, yeah, this is actually a really good thing for us mm. because we're no longer killing each other. Mm. We see that that was wrong. Uh, we see that Utu was wrong. 
We see that our previous ways were wrong. We want to move forward. Um, so they came to the table at Waitangi A with a belief that these settlers who had brought with them the gospel would act honourably. Mm. But they also understood that in doing so, that they needed to surrender their sovereignty to Queen Victoria and that this would be a change in, in the way that New Zealand was mm. forevermore. Yes. Anyway, now to the first clip about the Littlewood Treaty. A couple of things happened in December 2003 and January 2004, which effectively hobbled the Treaty Information Unit's planned program of ideological indoctrination. Investigate magazine published an article with ongoing commentary and subsequent issues, which challenged the very foundation upon which modern interpretation of the treaty were built. A long-standing unresolved issue concerning the treaty's true intended wording was jettisoned back into the public arena. From that moment on, planned government program of educating the public about the treaty's true meaning and intent would first require addressing this outstanding issue. Lingering questions about the status of the newfound treaty draft document in English, which the authorities promised the public would be forensically answered in 1992 had remained unanswered. The document found by the Littlewood family of Pukekohe, South Auckland, in 1989 and handed over to the National Archives in 1992 showed all of the attributes of the Hobson's final draft of the treaty, which historians freely admitted had been lost in February 1840. In 1992, Several leading historians speculated that the Littlewood Treaty was the much sought-after document that had eluded detection for over 150 years. Like the Maori language version, Tūriti o Waitangi, this draft, dated the 4th of February 1840, guaranteed equal rights for all people of New Zealand. Yeah, and now to just one example of our government's cover-ups and lying propaganda. Te Papa Museum, the Propaganda Museum of New Zealand. Let's look at some of the Te Papa content. Now, I'm sorry, folks, I couldn't fit all this on the screen. It is not the true English text used by Reverend Williams to translate into the Tiriti o Waitangi Maori text, the panel also admits to show the preamble section of the treaty, which has been described as the treaty's essence. The very important preamble section has been conspicuous by its absence from the government documents since about 1987. The final section affirmation is also missing. And the same applies to the Maori version and to this version as well. They've used lighting to darken it out at the top and at the bottom. Yeah, and now to the treaty. The chiefs of the Confederation of the United Tribes and the other chiefs who have not joined the Confederation cede to the Queen of England forever. Forever. The entire sovereignty of their country. The entire sovereignty of their country. Signed by William Hobson. Now we, the chiefs of the Confederation of the United Tribes of New Zealand, being assembled at Waitangi, and we, the other chiefs of New Zealand, having understood the meaning of these articles, accept of them, and agree to them all. In witness whereof our names or marks are affixed, done at Waitangi on the 
4th of February, 1840. The 4th of February, not the 6th of February. Do you note that? And you see Hobson's signature there. And you can see the date down here, 4th of February, 1840. Yeah, now folks, I've only scratched the surface of this document and the other stuff that's been going on in New Zealand. So I strongly urge you to see the Treaty of Waitangi website. Now I posted a link to it along with a link to Ian Wishart's video in the description below.